Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to MOOC NPTEL course on Bioengineering and Interface with Biology and Medicine. In the last two lectures, we discussed various issues and tried to understand why biology is required for engineers, in which way the discipline of bioengineering has made huge impact. Today let us start with some fundamentals and discuss about life properties and processes. So, what are the properties and processes which are associated with life? But let us first start what is life? So, in very simplest manner we can say that life is what living people do. We see their activity and we can uh, identify easily that what is living and what is dead. At the cellular level there are various biochemical pathways which govern the production of energy which is the chemical energy obtained from the food molecules and then this energy is required for the life processes to happen. Living world has so much diversity and complexity. How to make sense of them? So, let us look at some properties of life and I will provide you some illustrations for various properties by showing one illustrative organism. All these pictures are taken from the Campbell book which is the recommended book uh, at uh, IIT Bombay for the center graduate course. The figure numbers are also referring to the Campbell version uh, 10th edition. So, you can follow this book and you can also uh, follow these legends and details from this book. Let us first start with energy processing. As you can see in the image the butterfly is shown is trying to obtain the energy from the nectar of the flowers. The hummingbird can use this chemical energy which is stored in its food and now it can power the flight and other worlds. Let us look at the sunflower, how much orderliness we have in this flower, it illustrate you know very uh, beautiful example of the symmetrical structure which characterizes life. Now, let us look at the jack rabbit which illustrate the regulation, how the blood flow is regulated in the blood vessels and even the ear in this case help to maintain the constant body temperature and you know when the rabbit is uh, running fast it generates lot of heat. So, now these ear exchanges those uh, heat exchanges with the surrounding air and try to maintain the body temperature. Let us look at this pygmy seahorse which provides example for evolutionary adaptation. The appearance of this pygmy seahorse is pretty much camouflaging uh, the environment which is you know you can see in the red color and such adaptations evolve over the many generations will actually you know probably uh, become part of the hereditary and that is something which you know which is part of the Darwinism which we will talk later on as a part of the evolution that how many of these uh, you know positive changes which we have to adapt can actually uh, you know best suited to the environment could actually become part of the hereditary and may pass from the one to the next generation. Let us look at this oak seedling, one of the examples of a, of a plant which shows the growth and development which is required for all of us. This inherited in information in the plant will be continued to the next uh, plantlet, the seedlings and then it is required for the growth and development of organism. You can also see this Venus flytrap and it is interesting example that how in response to the environment this trap is rapidly uh, you know getting a stimulus and you know gets closed as soon as it sees the damsel uh, fly which lands on this particular trap. So, in response to environment it can make those immediate quick action and now it can respond to that environmental condition. Let us now talk about you know the reproduction which is one of the organisms living thing in the example you can see the giraffe, but that is pretty common to uh, every living being uh, where a baby giraffe is standing close to its mother it illustrate that reproduction is such an essential uh, process for the life. 
All right, so now let us talk about the unifying themes of life, how we think about the life forms. So, much bigger organization, let us start with that. So, the level of biological organization is starting from the biosphere, ecosystem, then community, looking at the population organism, then organs, tissue, cells, organelles and then molecules. So, all of these properties are you know governed at the systems level and much bigger biological organization is required for the life forms to actually occur. And these information then has to transmit from one to next generation and in the process which is the central dogma is uh, one of the fundamental concept where the information from DNA is transcribed uh, to the RNA form and then being translated to the proteins which form the central dogma for the information to flow. Let us now look at energy and matter. The transfer of energy and matter is very crucial because the how energy flows in the ecosystem uh, is governed with intricate relation of uh, various processes which are involved in this chemical cycling. Interactions are of course, very key for uh, the biological processes the life forms to happen uh, both at the uh, environmental level uh, with organism and as well as even at the biomolecular level where various type of biomolecules how they interact is very crucial for the life forms to govern. Let us now think about evolution which is one of the central theme of biology a very interesting concept and uh, as we go along in the lectures we will see that understanding these you know the biochemical properties and knowing these biomolecules and then finally trying to relate that at evolutionary level provides very interesting understanding of the central theme of biology which is evolution. So, organisms have very distinct morphology, but they have still very much commonality at the biochemical level. So, on the screen I am showing you one uh, image can you identify what this particular organism is. All right, so you have mentioned right it is bacteria which is Escherichia coli. Now, let us look at the next image this is fruit fly Drosophila melanogaster. Let us look at now this plant image this is Thalecris or Arabidopsis thaliana. Let us look at this worm what is this one this is a round worm or C elegans. What is this image this is you know small uh, microscopic thing you know, something looks like those are yeast Saccharomyces cerevisia and of course, uh, you know human which is homo sapiens. So, if you look at uh, them at the morphological level they are very different very distinct right. Uh, but when you go to their DNA level RNA and the protein level at the biochemical properties you will find you will be surprised in fact to see that how remarkable uniformity we have at the molecular level. So, then that probably indicates that we have all arisen from some common ancestor. So, let us now come to the fundamental uh, part which is cell and let us discuss about what is a cell. Let me first try to gauge you in the discussion and try to find out your understanding about a cell. It is one of the structural and functional unit of life. There could be more definitions of cell. It is an organism's basic unit of structure and function. It is fundamental to living systems of biology like you know the way you define atoms in the chemistry field and it is one of the simplest collection of matter which can be alive. So, in many ways you can define this cell, but fundamentally it is defining a living system of biology. We have billions of cells in our body and just imagine those billions of cell uh, has to really work in a very orchestrated manner together to govern many of the life processes. And what we are studying right now just one cell and how that cell different organelle and their properties how they are regulated. You just imagine that you know the living system is so complex and how beautifully it is governed that you know billions of cells has to perform in a very obedient manner otherwise if they start performing uh, you know in this regulated manner that may add up to or they that may cause some diseases right. So, what I have shown you here is you know from human body there are billions of cell possible and now if you look at uh, one of the cell nucleus which has all the nuclear content it has all the chromosomes then we are looking at the, the DNA segments and then we are defining that with genes we are interested to study for example. So, how you know small uh, units we are talking uh, if you think about starting from human. Now, just you know analogous to that uh, 
uh, like a cell, if you think about you know uh, a, a complex machinery like an aeroplane or like a car, uh, the way you have you know a lot of circuits and intricate uh, you know wirings uh, inside these machines, inside these uh, you know the car or the aeroplane. Similarly, in the cell, even to communicate from one to other organelle, the information to pass from one to other level, all of this requires lot of coordination, and it's no less than uh, you know circuit which you can see in the car on the right side versus the circuit shown in the left side for the cell. And there are in fact, you know the scientists who are trying to understand the uh, cell uh, more like in a circuit in which we by changing the one component to other component, how that can hamper or how that can accelerate different type of functions. So, that is something you know an interesting area where lot of engineering people want to study the cell like you know in the electrical manner to see that you know how different uh, circuits are governing these kind of life functions. So, if you now think at the cell at the structural level, most of the cells are uh, found uh, in the diameter of 1 to 100 microns and uh, of course, you know the bigger cell like you know the when you uh, go to take the chicken egg, uh, those are visibly uh, you can see from the naked eyes, uh, but when you want to start uh, looking at the, the smaller cells, uh, then you need the light microscope, uh, when most of the plant and animal cell you want to see can be seen with the light microscope. And then if you want to look at their ultra structural details, different type of organelle or you want to study bacteria or viruses, those things you have to see with the electron microscopy. So, for studying cells, uh, what has really you know made uh, a big revolution in biology is the uh, you know various type of advanced microscopy. Uh, our ability to know about the cell, about different cell organelles and looking at their ultra structural details was only possible because of various advancements which has happened in the field of microscopy. So, uh, we, we are not going to talk in much more detail right now about you know various type of microscopy, but I have illustrated on the uh, on an image here on the screen which shows you various sections taken from different cells and different type of microscopy which is used to obtain those images. For example, uh, from the left if you see the bright field image for the unstained specimen is shown and then on the right side of that is the stained specimen image is shown. Then the next one is the phase contrast image and then we have differential interference contrast uh, image shown and we have the fluorescence image. Then on the uh, right side of that we have a confocal uh, without and then the next one is confocal uh, with image and then we can see the deconvolution image on the right hand side and th that is the super resolution. Uh, again we have the you know, you know the changes of that variant form in the right hand side. Now, you look at the, the third image which is the scanning electron microscope or SEM and then we have the transmission electron microscopy or TEM. So, I am sure you must be wondering now that you know there are many types of microscopy available and how they are you know able to provide these informations. So, actually all the variants of the light microscopy uh, are being shown here except the one uh, like scanning electron microscopy and transmission electron microscopy which is a part of the electron microscope. So, rest everything is light microscopy. Light microscopy is going to allow you to image a live cell whereas, the, the electron microscopy you can only study when you have the dead cells because you have to make the sections and you are looking at the ultra structural details. So, just kind of broadly it gives you some sense and feel that if you want to look at the live cells uh, you have to use the light microscopy and its variants. If you are looking at the ultra structural detail, then you have to fix the cell, you have to make the sections, you have to uh, you know the cell will be dead in fact and then you can use different type of uh, scanning or transmission electron microscopy. All right, so now let us come to uh, various type of cells and on the screen I am showing you one image. Uh, can you recognize what this image is, uh, what type of uh, organism this particular uh, image is illustrating? Alright, so you are right it is a bacteria, it is a prokaryotic cell and when we say prokaryote it means pro means before uh, and karyon means nucleus. So, this does not possess a very true nucleus right. So, let us kind of I am showing you some arrow and you have to now guess uh, from your previous studies and previous understanding of a bacteria that what organelles are there shown on the screen. So, this first one is a nucleoid. Now, what is shown here is a bacterial chromosome, yes you are right it is flagella and then move on to the cell wall and now you can see the plasma membrane. Then we have ribosomes 
the tiny particles. A nucleoid is you know the, uh, the major component of the bacterial DNA which is actually free floating in the cytoplasm. It is not in it is not enclosed inside a nuclear membrane which kind of you know makes a distinction between the prokaryotes with the eukaryotes. All right, so now let us look at this image uh, and can you guess what this particular uh, you know cell is? Okay, this is an animal cell uh, coming from a eukaryotes. So now let us again go to the uh, arrows and try to find out the labels for them. So the very first one is uh, you are right it is nucleus. So what is the role of nucleus? Okay, we will come to the role of each of them in mo much more detail in some time, but ideally this you know all the genetic information is stored with the, uh, with the uh, various nuclear contents which are uh, found in the nucleus. You have DNA, RNA, these material there and this information has to then uh, move from the various other organelles which are surrounding to them to pass on from one to the, to the next cell and then you know there is lot of you know intricate communication is actually involved uh, within the cell and from one to other cell as well. So, we will talk about these things, but let us kind of continue trying to guess about now the next uh, arrow which is a plasma membrane. Then it comes the, uh, the tiny particles which is ribosomes and then we have uh, these the green colored ones what is shown is the Golgi apparatus. Then we have mitochondria and peroxisomes, this one is microvilli. These are cytoskeletal elements and now we have centrosomes. Finally, this is a flagellum and we have endoplasmic reticulum shown in the network over there. We have then lysosomes. So, uh, it just kind of refreshes you about you know uh, what you have studied in the past uh, regarding the cell and their different organelle. Uh, we will again talk to you about their function in some time, but let us kind of try to get you know morphological uh, uh, uniqueness from the prokaryotes to different type of eukaryotic cell. And now let us guess what is this uh, image shown on the screen for uh, this eukaryotic cell. So, this is a plant cell and now let us move on to look at you know the different components of these uh, plant cells. Yeah, so, in the arrow what is shown now it is a nucleus and now we have endoplasmic reticulum then ribosomes. This is something which is very different than the animal cells right which is a much larger volume a central vacuole. Then we have cytoskeletal elements. Now we have chloroplast which is again uh, you know one of the distinguishing feature of plant cells plasmodesmata. Then we have a cell wall a very thick one and a plasma membrane. Then these are peroxisomes mitochondria Golgi apparatus. So, many of these organelles are common in both plant and animal cell, but there are certain unique uh, organelle which gives plant cells more adaptability for you know for them to live in the uh, open field in the environment and do many processes which uh, they are doing different than the animal cells. So, we will talk about the functions in some time, but let us now move on again uh, thinking about the broad categories of prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So, broadly as we discussed pro means primitive and carry on means nucleus and u means advanced. When we have a distinct boundary of the nucleus then we say this is a eukaryotic cell whereas if it is diffused found in the cytoplasm then that is a prokaryote. So, the diverse organisms they could be divided into uh, three fundamental groups the bacteria the formerly known as uh, u bacteria or archaea which is formerly known as archaebacteria and eukarya which is a eukaryote. This distinction can be made on the basis of their biochemical characteristics as well as these fundamental groups are known as domains. A scientist Carl Woos uh, he suggested to group these organisms into three domains on the basis of their 16S ribosomal RNA properties. What is shown on the image here is a tangled web of life. It shows the domain eukarya domain archaea and domain bacteria. And what it also shows that you know uh, from the proteobacteria and cyanobacteria when it you know uh, the more archaea and the eukarya were generated especially the methanogen thermophiles, animalia, fungi and plantae. Then we have you know the sum of the horizontal gene transfer was seen and probably chloroplast and mitochondria played an important role in that process. 
So, broadly when we are thinking about three domains of life we have bacteria, couple of examples are shown like estrichia, uh, salmonella, we have bacillus. Uh, in case of archaea we have examples like methanococcus, archaeoglobus and halobacterium and in case of eukarya we have examples like saccharomyces, homo sapiens and GMAs. So, these branches indicate the pattern of divergence from the common ancestors and the DNA sequence uh, distinction defines that these are the three major domains of life. The evolutionary path could actually be analyzed based on their biochemical properties. Let us look at one of the classes of uh, you know these three domains of life, uh, archaea in some more detail we will be talking about the uh, you know more uh, functional details for both uh, prokaryotes and eukaryotes you know uh, in the subsequent lectures, but let us kind of you know briefly discuss about archaea. What the archaeas are? Are they super creature because they can live in the you know, very hot environment which is like a thermophiles, they can live in the uh, salt fields, they can also live it uh, in the uh, methane gas environment or known as methanogens. So, these are uh, you know very extreme environmental condition and uh, the organism to survive in those conditions have to really adapt those and then only they can uh, you know survive in those condition. So, these archaea are actually prokaryotes which are uh, distantly related to the bacterialoic organisms. Uh, their cell membranes have some chemical properties which makes them different from both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. It means they have certain uniqueness like their cell membrane does not contain fatty acid, but it contains some uh, branch molecule which is known as isoprenes. So, uh, looking at them it looks like they are not the prokaryote, but rather they had certain you know uniqueness which gives them some unique identity. And just imagine biologically why it is important for us to know about these kind of uh, organism and why we have to study these kind of extreme conditions. Just imagine that you know uh, when people are observing the nature and looking at even the extreme uh, nature conditions what kind of organisms can grow and survive those can provide us lot of clues which can be really translated back into the actual uh, day to day life conditions. For example, uh, the invention of polymerase chain reaction or PCR just happened because Cary Mullis he uh, observed that you know the uh, one of the bacteria which is uh, lives into the hot spring very hot weather hot conditions uh, it can survive in that type of you know uh, uh, hot temperature and then probably its physiology is meant its enzymes are meant in such a way that it can withstand very high temperature. So, Thermus aquaticus was the uh, organism which he isolated and then he obtained uh, the enzyme which is uh, TAC polymerase which is now being used for doing the polymerase chain reaction or PCR. In this manner just imagine that you know this entire molecular biology which is you know one of the fundamentals is to uh, use the PCR polymerase chain reaction is so much depending on this enzyme and that was not possible to obtain if somebody has not made close observation that there are some group of bacteria which could live into these kind of hot con uh, condition. So, it is important for us to make these kind of observations from the nature not only the normal condition, but also what is found in the very adverse conditions. So, archaea they are actually uh, uh, if you look at uh, their biochemical behavior they are probably more similar to eukaryotes although they are uh, they, they have similarity from the you know prokaryotes as well, but they have more similarity uh, to eukaryotes than if you think about you know their similarity with the bacteria. Uh, both archaea and eukaryotes uh, their genome they encode for the homologous histone proteins which could be associated with DNA and which is not the case when you think about the uh, prokaryotes because bacteria they lack histones. Even RNA and protein components of these archaean ribosomes they are much more similar to the eukaryotes as compared to the bacteria. Now, this again summarizes the tree of life which we have been discussing we have the uh, prokaryotes we have the bacteria and we have archaea and probably there was one common ancestor uh, of all life forms which has given rise to these kind of tremendous diversity. Let me explain you this in more detail in the uh, following animation. All living organisms from various periods of evolution have been found to exhibit remarkable similarity at the biochemical level. Genetic information is stored in the form of DNA or RNA. The same set of 20 amino acids form the structural elements of proteins. 
similar metabolic pathways and several proteins with structural similarity have been found to have similar roles in different organisms. All of these point towards the existence of a common ancestor from which various organisms evolved at different points of time. Several proteins have been identified that possess similar three-dimensional structures and perform very closely related functions in organisms that are separated in evolution over billions of years. One such protein is the Tata box binding protein, which plays an important role in gene regulation. Archaea are a group of prokaryotic organisms that are distinctly related to bacteria-like organisms. They are, however, more similar to eukaryotes than bacteria. Both archaea and eukaryotic genomes encode homologous histone proteins which are not present in bacteria. The ribosomal RNA and proteins, or archaea, closely resemble those of eukaryotes. However, archaea are capable of growing in extreme environmental conditions such as high temperatures, salt concentrations, etc. One of the most recent classifications of living organisms is a three-domain system consisting of bacteria, eukarya and archaea. Although archaea were originally considered as bacteria, they were later classified into their own domain due to several differences in their metabolic pathways and genetics. Eukaryotes are believed to have evolved through several endosymbiotic relationships between various bacteria and archaea. So today in the uh, starting with the life forms, uh, we started discussing about processes and properties which are associated with life and we highlighted various examples to discuss about it which could uh, actually display the kind of diversity we have, but is still lot of you know uh, unifying a theme we have because we are still sharing lot of you know common properties and those are governed in different uh, you know animals, different organisms and those properties are shared. Then we started discussing about the cell and you know the uh, at least an overview of the cell, uh, a distinction between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells and then uh, try to give you the feel of how different you know the uh, major life forms or the tree of life has originated especially from the uh, prokaryotes, eukaryotes and the archaea and some of their uh, you know the basic uh, distinct features of archaeal forms. We will continue our discussion about the cell and its properties looking at the structure and function for uh, various cell organelle and how they uh, actually govern different you know cell processes. Also we will talk about how cells communicate to each other and how communication also happens within the cell. So, let us discuss these points in the next lecture. Thank you.